Hi everyone, I'm Jerry Schumann, pastor here at Ludlow Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that this video blesses and encourages you in your faith. And please consider sharing this on social media. Doing so is a strategic way that we're able to share the gospel with other people today. But before we begin, please keep this in mind. This video is not intended to be, and really it cannot be, a replacement for your commitment to a local church. God commands his people to gather regularly for worship and for fellowship under the leadership and the care of godly elders where the whole body is knit together and that's how the body grows and builds itself up in love. So nothing online can be a replacement for that. So if you're in the area, uh, come and join us for worship. We'd love to have you with us. If you're not nearby, please be sure that you are committed to a local, faithful, Bible-believing church. Thank you, and God bless. Our call to worship today, this Lord's Day, October 1st, the year 2023. Call to worship is based on the third stanza of the 119th Psalm. It's a call to Gimel. Deal bountifully with your servant, that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. I am a sojourner on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. You rebuke the insolent, accursed ones who wander from your commandments. Take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have kept your testimony. Even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. A few thoughts on that precious set of verses. I catch two important topics, um, thoughts in the second paragraph particularly. First, the rebuke of the Lord God the Almighty is directed towards the insolent. The descriptor insolent carries a sense of sneering. Could the Lord be focusing on those who refuse to take him seriously? Do they earn a special element of his disfavor? The second thought is when our scribe finds approbation in meditating on the Lord's statutes in obedience, finding delight in them, and far more significant when they serve as his counselors. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Let us pray. Please rise. Lord, we assemble here on your day seeking your face in worship and thanksgiving. You and you alone are the Lord God, the triumphant, the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Lord, cleanse our hearts and souls. May we be fully dedicated to worshiping and praising you on this, your day, the Lord's day. Amen. God is greater
us come joyfully to hear the reading of God's Word. As Kevin said, our reading comes from the book of 1 John, from chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 2, verse 2. The Word of Life. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy can be complete. Walking in the light. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. On to chapter 2. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of God. Let us receive it as such. You may be seated. As Bill said, let us uh, come to the word joyfully. We should always do that. But certainly this portion of scripture that Bill just read for us, we should certainly hear that joyfully. And in fact, uh, that fourth verse of what John, uh, of what Bill, John uh, is saying to the people, I'm writing this to you so that your joy may be full, or that your joy uh, may be complete. Last uh, three or four weeks at the prayer meeting, we've been taking time to pray especially for revival. Again, revival locally, revival in Vermont, revival in the United States, revival in the world. And if you're paying attention at all, you know how badly we need a revival. We need people to get serious uh, and committed to serving uh, the Lord. And this last Wednesday, uh, Jerry was sharing with us some ideas from him and from others but one reason why perhaps we're not having the revival in some churches that we should have. And one of the things they talked about was Christians, sadly, do not value many of the things that we should value. Certainly, we need to value the Trinity, as uh, John mentioned, God the Father, Christ the Son, the Holy Spirit, how we need to value them. And I can't picture any of you people not valuing them. But we need to value other things as well. We need to value the church. We need to value the church services and the church, church meetings. We need to value uh, the Word of God. And we need to value the fellowship we can have with one another. And we need to value some of the activities that should be going on in the church. For example, communion, the Lord's Supper. How sadly that some do not value the Lord's Supper. They do not value uh, the communion table. Jesus himself, remember, told the disciples, do this in remembrance of me. 
as we remember Calvary, as we remember what took place there, how can we not value the Lord's Supper? So this morning, as we lead up to the communion experience, I'd like to emphasize three things. I'd like to emphasize the wickedness of sin, how evil sin is. Secondly, I'd like to emphasize the love of God. Praise God. In the evilness that sin has, we have the love of God. And then, of course, the cleansing power of the blood of Christ. And if we're going to appreciate that at all, we need the Holy Spirit's help. So let's pray. All right, Heavenly Father, how we do take time right now to thank you for Calvary. How we thank you, Lord, for sending your son. How we thank your son for coming to the cross, for not simply leaving heaven, but to come here in a world full of sin and darkness and filth and iniquity. And he was willing to take all of that upon his shoulders. We thank you for that. And Lord, how we thank you for the Holy Spirit who has shown us that this is not only something that we can graciously read in your word, but through your Holy Spirit's help, we have come to believe it. We thank you for that, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that uh, we will, in fact, value what took place on Calvary. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've uh, closed your books to that passage, I, I invite you to reopen them to 1 John. We're going to be referring to that uh, from time to time. But that first picture I want us to look at is the evil of sin, the wickedness of sin, the danger of sin. The devil is so clever. He disguises sin, doesn't he? He uh, gets us to tolerate it, both our sin and the sins of others. Uh, he offers sin to us as something fun, as something exciting, as something charming, as something uh, uh, promising. Uh, we see that all those things that we see advertised on TV or on the internet, or maybe even from our friends and from our relatives, uh, disguised sin, telling us that sin is okay, that sin is fun. We need to remember this. Satan is the father of lies. And that is, of course, a lie. Sin is not like that. Sin is deadly. Sin is destructive. Sin harms. And many times, of course, it is, unfortunately, it's harming uh, innocent people. Sin hurts. And worst of all, sin separates sinful man from a holy God. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The cross exposes sin for what it is. The cross exposes sin for how dreadful and how harmful it is. In short, it is the sins of the world, your sins and my sins, that put Jesus on the cross. And we need to remember that. Uh, so many times I think people see uh, the damage of sin after sin has already been committed and not before. Uh, we think, uh, if only I had known what was going to happen. If I had only I had known the damage it was going to cause, or the hurt it was going to cause, or the problems it was going to cause, I never would have done it. We need to see sin before that. And if we remember the cross, it will help us to remember how evil sin is. It will keep us from yielding to temptation, I think. Uh, Thinking of the cross, remembering the cross is a tremendous spiritual lesson, a tremendous spiritual help, but it's also a tremendous practical help as well. If you can remember it was sin that put Jesus on the cross and you are tempted to sin, hopefully that will keep you. I'm not going to do that. That put Jesus on the cross. There's no way I'm going to do it. So it can be a very, very practical help as well. Certainly we directly see how sin was related uh, to the cross. We see the treachery of Judas. We see the craftiness of Caiaphas. We see the cowardice of Pilate. We see the uh, fickleness and the indifference or the rebellion of the mob who cried out, uh, crucify him. We see the cruelty of the soldiers who spat on Jesus and whipped Jesus and put that crown of thorns on Jesus. We see the irreverence and the lack of belief by the people who mocked him and cried out to him uh, on the cross. And when we think about those things, we react, oh, wow, keep me from that. 
I don't want to do any of those. But we can have other sins, can we not? We can have a sin of temper, or impatience, or pride, or laziness, or drugs, or gluttony, or immorality, or prayerlessness, or apathy, or rebellion, that Jerry talked about last week with King Saul. Again, your sins and my sins, all those things are the types of things that put Jesus uh, on the cross. He went to the cross to pay the price for our sins. Without sin, if nobody had ever sinned, there would have been no reason for Jesus to die. There would have been no reason for Jesus to go to the cross. But because of sin, he had to go there. A Scottish uh, husband-wife team that I have appreciated down through the years, uh, Stuart and Jill Briscoe, some of you uh, may, may know them. I've heard them speak a couple of times. I've read uh, two or three of their books. And in one of Jill Briscoe's books, uh, There's a Snake in My Garden. You catch the title, right? There's a snake in my garden, referring to Satan. But I, like, I especially love one sentence from that book. She puts it like this. Eve and Adam took a bite of the apple. And Jesus began walking to Calvary. As soon as that sin happened, it was necessary, of course, for Jesus to go to Calvary. So that cross, that sin, should just make us recoil at the thought of the sin that put him there. In remorse at the damage it has done. Uh, in sadness at the, the lives that have been hurt and the causes of the problems. Uh, sorrow that the Holy Son of God had to take all those filthy sins upon himself to save uh, you and I. So we see sin in its wickedness. We see sin in its evil. We see sin in its damage. And we need to get away from it. James tells us to flee from sin or to run from sin. Don't play around with it. Don't fool around with it. Don't tolerate it. But run from sin. But, but, as we recoil from sin, as we run from sin, let us run to God. Because that second picture that I want to emphasize is, of course, the love of God. The cross reveals the love of God. The Father had to send the Son because He was the only one that could pay the price. The Son had to come because He was the only one who had to do it. So the Father sent the Son, and the Son came in love. In love, of course, for you and I. Uh, you can see that love in his entire life here. You can see that love when he uh, healed the leper and so many other pieces. You can see that love uh, when he gave sight to the blind and healing uh, to the deaf. You can see that love when he raised Lazarus from the dead. You can see that love when he picked up those children in his arms uh, and blessed them. You can see that love as he washed his disciples' feet. Love, love, love. Constantly. But especially, oh, especially, you can see the love on the cross. Jesus dying for you and I. You all know this verse, 90% of you, probably 100% of you. John 3.16, for God so loved the world. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It was all done in love. And that parallel verse over in 1 John 3.16, this is how we know what love is. Christ Jesus died for us. The love revealed on the cross. So as you partake of communion this morning, I pray that you will feel that love of God just bursting in your heart. I pray that it will be bubbling out of your heart and that will cause that love to reach the Father. Love for the Son and love for the other people who are joining in with you. That's the, one of the great things about communion. We do this together. We share this together. We are unified, of course, uh, in together. No greater love. I love that song that Joe has sung and other people have sung, uh, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. Or when he was on the cross, you were on his mind. No greater love, no greater love. Uh, before we finish this morning, we're gonna sing that song, The Wonder of It All. The Wonder of It All, I love that song. 
that God should love me, that Jesus should love me. We all like that 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians that talks about love. And of course, that is really talking about God's love and what God's love is and how he wants to give that love to us. His love suffers long. His love is kind. His love bears all things and hopes all things and endures all things. It's a love that cannot be clenched. And then we go to Romans 8 and we read that you and I, children of God, can never be separated from that love. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. We remember a Savior who not only gave his life for us, who not only saved us, who not only redeemed us, who not only reconciled us, who not only justified us, but he did all this in love. We talked about that verse this morning in Sunday school. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Why would he have joy? Because he was redeeming people that he loved. And he knew that was the only way, of course, that could be done it. <clears throat> May we remember that with a, with a thrilling appreciation and a deep reverence for the one who was crucified for us and for love that was behind it. So we see that vivid contrast. We see the evil, the darkness, the terribleness of sin and the results. And yet we see the tremendous love of God. Thirdly, let's think about the blood of Christ. As we remember Calvary, as we remember the blood that Jesus Christ shed for us, John tells us here in this passage that Bill read for us two wonderful characteristics of that blood of Christ. First of all, it cleanses from all sin. It cleanses from all sin. We read in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There is no forgiveness of sin. That blood has to be shed. In the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, that blood had to be shed by an innocent lamb. In the New Covenant, for you and I, that blood still has to be shed by an innocent lamb. But there's only one who's innocent. And that is the Lamb of God, Jesus. And so he had to shed his blood for you and I. We've all sinned. Sometimes we think some of our sins is big. Sometimes we think some of our sins is little. And we could be wrong. But we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all committed acts of sin. Sometimes we have not done what we should have done. What some people call sins of omission. We haven't done what we should have done. We are all covered by sin. We need to be cleansed. We need to have that sin removed. And that's what Jesus did on Calvary. Sometimes I think we fail to grasp the significance of that uh, cleaning. Praise God for his forgiveness. When we repent, when we put our faith and trust in Christ, when we go to him for salvation, when we go to him to be our savior, our sins are forgiven. Praise God for that. Again, the wonder of it all, that he should love, that he should forgive. But God, in his infinite grace, always does things far more than you and I can even imagine. He not only forgives, he erases that stain of sin, just as if we had never done. He removes that stain. When we come initially in faith, he cleanses us, and he forgives all those past sins that we may have done, but he continues to forgive and to cleanse us as we go to him for forgiveness and how equally glad we should be for this. Repeatedly cleansed until that day in heaven when we walk in white. John says this in Revelation, referring to the redeemed, these are they who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Maybe we can see this a little bit better as we think about the physical reflecting uh, the spiritual. Uh, you get up in the morning, uh, maybe you take a shower, maybe you take a bath, maybe you just wash up really nice and you clean. But then you have to do it again. Maybe three or four or five times during the day. Or the next day, you have to get the same thing. And the day after that, and the day after that, and the day after that, over and over again, you have to do that cleansing. You may have gotten dirty knowingly. Right? You may have uh, worked on the car. 
You may have built a house. You may have worked in the garden. You knew that you were getting dirty. It may have happened without realizing it. All of a sudden you walk in the house and you realize, hey, I'm filthy. Sort of like uh, that uh, famous character Pigpen in Venus. Gets, gets dirty all the time and you never can figure out why. That can happen to us spiritually. We need that cleansing daily. And in fact, we need it many times daily to be cleansed. Again, one day, by the grace of God, you believed. And you were saved. But since then, you have not been perfect. Not one of us. Not one of us is perfect. Uh, some, sometimes people fantasize a perfect life when they're never going to sin. But John has just talked about this, right? If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. We've all sinned, even after we came to put our faith in Christ. Sometimes, again, knowingly, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously. But we have a glorious God who has already made provision for those sins. The very one who cleansed us, the one who put his life for us on the cross and cleansed us as we went to him for salvation continues to cleanse us as we go to him. That shed blood can continually cleanse us. But I would be amiss if I didn't point out an important condition. John talks about it in verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is just and ready to forgive us. As we confess those sins, he loves to forgive. And I love that first verse in chapter 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. That would be the preference, but sadly it's going to happen. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate who speaks in the Father in our defense. I like the way uh, Living uh, NIV puts that. We have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous. Satan loves to accuse us. You read the book of Job. And Satan is appearing before God, telling him, have you looked at Job? Have you seen what Job is like? Satan loves to accuse us. Satan loves to go and say something to God, something like this. Have you seen what that Chuck Bostock character did? Did you see what he did? Did you hear what he said? Did you look into his heart and his mind and see what he thought? You call him a Christian? And no sooner does he say that, and we have the advocate who stands up and says, he is one of ours. He has been washed in my blood. He doesn't plead our innocence. He doesn't plead that we never said that, or we never did that, or we never thought that. But what he pleads is that we have been washed in his blood. We are his children. We belong, of course, uh, to him. We have been washed in that blood. That doesn't mean, of course, that we try to take advantage of this, that we just go ahead and sin and figure that God was going to forgive us. We don't take advantage of God's grace. Of course, that's a whole other sermon. But if it happens, if we goof up, if we fall, if we make a mistake, we have that advocate. And isn't he at the perfect place, at the right hand of the Father? He doesn't have to travel a thousand miles or fifty miles or from one space to another. He's at the right hand of his father. And he immediately will speak up on our defense. And there's a second wonderful characteristic of that blood. And that is the power of that blood. Verse 7, if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive all of our sins. Verse 9, he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He doesn't cleanse us from just half of our sin, or just three quarters of our sin, or nine tenths of our sin. He cleanses us from all sin, from all, of course, uh, unrighteousness. Not just the small, the weak, but the big ones, the major ones, the unimaginable, terrible things that we might have done. That blood has the power to cleanse us from even those. I think many Christians sometimes 
find it difficult to believe that they can be forgiven or cleansed from some particular sin. They think it's just too bad. It's just too wicked. It's just too terrible. They're afraid that they're going to have to live with that for the rest of their lives. Not so. Not so. That habit, that fall, that temptation, God's power, the power of that blood can wipe it clean. Just as the grace of God knows no limits, just as the love of God knows no limits, the power of the shed blood knows no limits. It can cleanse us from all sin. That uh, phrase from that song uh, that uh, we sometimes uh, sing it is well with my soul. Of all the bliss of this glorious thought, my sins, not in part, but in whole, have been nailed to the cross, and I bear them no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We have that omnipotent blood. What you think is the worst sin you have ever committed, or the smallest sin you've ever committed, and you, you might be wrong. The blood of Christ can cleanse you from that. There is power in the blood. This song that you said, there's power in the blood. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's power in the blood. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? Sin stands are lost in its life-giving flow. Don't you wish for all that? There's power in the blood. The blood is powerful enough to do that. When we were freshmen at Gordon, uh, we had chapel three times a week. And most of us were fresh out of high school, 18, 19, 20 years old. But there was a gentleman in our class who was 40 years old. He had just spent 20 years in prison for doing all sorts of terrible sin. And he deserved to be in prison for those sins, and he readily admitted that. But in the last two or three years when he was there, God in his grace reached out and saved him. And he spoke one of those early chapels our freshman year. And he had become an evangelist. And his theme song was, There's Power in the Blood. And this is one thing he tried to emphasize. You can't tell me there's no power in the blood. I know there's power in the blood. That power saved me, and that power cleansed me. And so we come full cycle as we come to the communion table. We see the evilness of sin, and I hope that we refrain from that. Remember the wickedness of sin, and of course, especially your sin in particular. If you've never confessed to that sin, I pray that you will do so now. Taste of that sweet forgiveness. Taste of that sweet cleansing. Taste of that sweet peace that you can have when you have gone, of course, to God for forgiveness. It would be hypocritical to remember the communion table, to remember the blood that Christ shed to do away with our sins and then refuse to do away with your sin to want to hang on to it, to refuse to confess it. As we remember him dying for those sins, may we confess any sins that we have and ask his forgiveness and his cleansing. And of course, remember the love of God, the love so revealed on Calvary. And remember the blood of Jesus Christ who cleanses us from all sin. Let's pray. All right, Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for everything the cross shows us. Help us, Lord, to hate sin as much as you hate sin. Help us, Lord, to love your Son as much as you loved him. And I pray, Lord, that we will love you the way that you love us. Your Holy Spirit wants to do that, he wants to shed that love in our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that we will get out of the way and let the Holy Spirit do that. And Lord, how we thank you for that cleansing power of the shed blood. It can take away our sins. So I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.